thanks for coming, everyone. Um, we got two really good talks tonight. Good, and they're the ones I really wanted to see. So that's that's how I wanted it to be. Uh, this first one we've got is uh, Rich from Raven Technologies uh, out near Bradley Stoke. Um, they're a really uh, forward company in terms of research on edge ML, and they're doing some absolutely amazing stuff at the edge, uh, and also some amazing stuff with synthetic data, which Rich is going to talk about today. So I'll let him wade straight in. Cool, thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you for the instruction. So I'm gonna give a really an overview of uh, synthetic data for computer vision. So firstly, I wanna go over what we mean by synthetic data, um, why we need it, and then really like how to get started using it. And then hopefully towards the end, we can sort of touch a little bit about what the future of, of this field um, could look like. So as you're probably aware, machine learning tasks are really heavily reliant on data, right? We need very, very large data sets. And what's more, we need that data to be annotated, right? So it's not enough just to go off and collect a load of images for whatever it is you're trying to train your ML to do. You have to go through and annotate that data. So you need that data to have the ground truth labels, as we call them. What the ML is going to do in during training is it's going to use that annotation, that ground truth, to correct itself, right? It's going to update itself during training in order to get better at whatever it is that we're training it to do. And whilst there are lots of public data sets available, so this is ImageNet, a very famous data set with, which are annotated, they're unlikely to cover the use case that it, you know, whatever it is that you're looking for. And, and if they do cover your use case, they are not going to provide the diversity and variance of data that you need to create a robust model, which we'll talk about in a second. So collecting and annotating data is arguably the biggest bottleneck, really, when we're trying to train an ML algorithm uh, today. We can take a lot of computer vision sort of architectures that have been proven to work off the shelf pretty much these days. Anyone can sort of train an ML algorithm to some degree with just a few lines of code. But unless you've got that data set, you're not going to be able to get started. So just to be clear what we mean by uh, labeling data. So we have differing degrees of, of uh, computer vision tasks. This isn't an exhaustive list by any means, but the, the, it's going to depend on your use case, basically. It's going to depend on what you want your ML algorithm to be able to do uh, at the end of the training, i.e. what is it you know, it's going to actually be put into production to do. So in the top left here, we've got image recognition, and this is the simplest one. This is just saying, is the item of interest, um, does it just exist in the image at all? Is there a dog present? Is there a sheep? Is there a, a horse? It's just saying, is it there in the image at all? Below that, we have this sort of object detection case. So this is what's referred to as bounding boxes, and this is object localization. Where in the image uh, do we think the thing is? Then we have semantic segmentation. So this is actually a pixel level classification task now. It's actually providing this detailed image mask and it's telling us exactly um, where the algorithm thinks the, the, the items of interest are. And then we have instant segmentation, which is arguably the, the sort of most complicated labeling task where we've actually distinguished between the different instances of the, of the sheep in this case. It's not just sort of blocked out in one color. We've actually distinguished between them. And there's an entire industry now of companies who will do this kind of labeling work for you. So it seems quite simple, really. Like if you imagine just doing one of these, it's really straightforward, right? You could just draw some bounding boxes. But as soon as you try and scale this to the amount of images that you're going to need for a real task, it suddenly becomes um, not just, you know, impossible in the sense of like, we have to sit there for a day or so. It's just, an uns you know, it requires human teams of very large amounts of people to, to do this process. There are lots and lots of companies now whose entire job is just to label data for you. Um, Google offer this service, AWS, Amazon Turk. And what they're doing is they're subtracting this work out to large teams of people who are being paid relatively small amounts of money to do this very repetitive task over and over again in order to, to label, your, label your data. Just to sort of talk about some of the other challenges that you've got when you're just collecting the data, right? So actually it could be very hard just to collect the data in the first place, depending on your use case. It could be that the things you're trying to detect are very rare. They're not things that you have access to. You can't just take a video camera out and start filming them. It could be that it's quite dangerous situations or just situations that's very costly to get to. If you're trying to sort of send something to the moon, for example, and want it to work well, you're not going to be able to sort of collect data. Privacy issues as well, GDPR, we can't necessarily just be like using our customers' data for this. Um, you might want to go beyond the sort of RGB spectrum that we're seeing here. So you might want to do like LiDAR, thermal, all those kinds of use cases. Um, and then it could be that your data changes all the time, right? So if you're training, say, um, let's say like a, a robot that's operating in a warehouse where the, the, uh, the goods that it's dealing with are changing on a weekly basis, then you're going to have to, you know, it's not just a one-time thing you're going to have to do. So you're going to have to iterate a lot anyway, even on this process. So what is synthetic data? So <clears throat> synthetic data is really any data that has been generated uh, in some sort of artificial manner. 
So by that, I mean it hasn't been taken in the computer vision sense, just with a traditional camera. And that's likely to be through some sort of 3D modeling software. So that's what we're seeing here is, is a drone that's been rendered uh, in Blender, which is the sort of thing you'd use to do like animations or, or make games in. Unreal, Unity, Maya, all these kinds of things that graphic uh, designers or artists use. Or it could have been generated by another ML algorithm. So we're now seeing generative AI, this sort of rise of things like Stable Diffusion and DALI and all these models, and um, Sora, which is about to sort of change everything, where actually we can be generating data from uh, another process as well. And it's worth noting at this point that synthetic data doesn't just cover computer vision, right? It also covers um, large language models as well. So a lot of smaller large language models are being trained by data that is coming from larger um, models, and that's also considered um, a synthetic approach. So just as a sort of summary here, we've touched on a lot of these already, but time and cost are your, are your main reasons for wanting to go with a synthetic approach. Essentially, it removes the need for the human labeling is the, is the primary uh, use case, because when you render uh, an image in 3D modeling software, what's happening is, is a process called ray tracing, right? Probably all familiar with this idea where you're, you're essentially simulating light passing through that scene into a camera. So you're taking what is a 3D model of a world and you're rendering it into a 2D image that we can recognize as a, as a photograph. It's so like Pixar and all these things is a big thing about rendering. And because you're able to sort of render those individual you know, paths through the scene, you can get your annotations for free, right? We can get that bounding box, we can get that image mask, we can get depth masks, we can get any kind of annotation we want without a human having to sit there and doing it um, manually by hand. Much more precise labels, um, and obviously we can produce many more uh, for a fraction of the time and, and the cost. We can introduce more data variants because we're able to simulate and randomize the, the data much, much easier. So, you know, if you were to go out and do a manual collect, that collect is likely to be whatever the lighting conditions were that day, the weather conditions that day. We can simulate light, we can simulate weather, we can simulate different landscapes, different, um, you know, whatever you want to simulate. Rare events is another one, especially when using synthetic data for verifying a model. So, you know, we've all probably seen examples online where a driverless car has encountered something on the road that is very unusual, maybe like a horse and car or an advertisement on the side of a, a lorry or something, and it completely confuses it because it hasn't seen that in training. So we can create those kind of anomalous uh, rare events. Occlusions is where um, something has been obscured by, um, by something, and we can, um, because the the um, rendering software effectively can see through the occlusions, we can actually get much more detailed labels as to predicting where we think something is behind a, a barrier of some kind. And then we can look at custom sensors. So we can actually simulate very specific types of sensors. We could have thermal cameras, we could have just specific different types of lenses, right? If you were trying to capture images on your phone, it's going to look very different to a, a GoPro camera, for example, or it's going to be very different from a drone that is using a different sort of lens, like a fisheye lens or something. So we can actually really make it very bespoke to your, uh, to your use case. So this is the pipeline, basically. So we build a scene of some kind. So this scene is just the entire kind of space, the, the, the space that we, um, we want to be putting our model into deployment. So that could be like a factory or a warehouse or a production um, assembly line or just whatever it is you're doing. We're going to import the assets into that scene, the stuff that we're interested in uh, detecting not just the stuff we're interested in detecting, but also all the other clutter that's going to be in the scene in production as well, right? We don't want to just fit it onto, um, onto the specific item of interest. We want to make sure that we're, we're showing it stuff that it's going to encounter as well. And we want to randomize that. We want to create random variation in the data set. So that's what this second step's about. And then we generate the data. So this is the rendering process. So we're actually going from that 3D randomized configuration of the domain, and we're turning that into an image. And we're also getting our labels, the most important thing, and those will be output, output into you know, the correct um, Kitty or Coco format, whatever format you, you want to use. And then we're going to train and we're going to validate our model. So depending on what you're doing, right, you, can, you could work in a purely synthetic way if you want to, but if you're doing this in any kind of professional capacity where you, you really care about like the reality of how well your model is performing, you need to be validating against real data. So you are going to have to do a small amount of real collect because the challenge with synthetic, and this is the, the real, real challenge, is going from synthetic to real, right? This is, the, this is the gap that we're trying to bridge. We're trying to get an algorithm that's only ever seen synthetic virtual images to perform well in when it's seeing physical images. Ideally, our synthetic data would be so good that the AI doesn't even realize in inverted commas that it's now actually in the real world rather than in the synthetic world, but that's obviously down to how good you can make your synthetic data. What we can do when we see a poor performance on our real data is 
normally in traditional processes, we'd go back and we'd tune the hyperparameters of our model, right? We'd start tuning and say, okay, well, we'll increase the learning rate or we'll add some dropout or something, whatever it is we're going to do. But we can actually go back now and we can tune the generation pipeline as well. So we can tweak the way that we're generating the data. We can add extra assets. If it's failing on particular things, we can add things. It's still a very tricky process, right? You do that and something else might break over here, but we've suddenly got a whole automated pipeline that we can, that we can play with. So this is just a very quick sort of use case I want to show you in case you want to get started with this kind of thing. And this is based on a blog that I wrote uh, a couple, maybe two or three years ago now, actually. So it's a little bit out of date, but, it's, it, but I think it's a good example of how you might get started with this. And then I'm going to talk about some of the more kind of um, advanced ways of doing stuff a little bit. So what I wanted to do was create an algorithm that could detect a drone flying through the sky, right? That was, that was the case. And I wanted to put a bounding box around that drone if it saw it. Um, and what I was able to do is use Blender. So Blender is an open source 3D modeling piece of software. So the first thing is we have to build the scene. So what I found is there's these things called high dynamic range imaging. I don't know, didn't know what that meant at the time, but the HDRIs. Um, and what these are is they're people who are really into photography will go out and they'll collect a mul multiple sort of range of pictures of a scene. And they'll um, somehow using software, put them all together and create a 360 degree realistic sort of photo backdrop. So you can imagine it's like a, like a snow globe and projected onto that snow globe is the scene. What we're seeing here are sort of flattened versions of those, of those environments. So I downloaded a load of these. So there's a, there's a free open source uh, site where you can download these. Um, there's a few, well, there's, there's thousands on there, but I picked like a hundred um, just to pick from. And then I went to do this scene, scene randomization. So I took the, the 3D model drone that you saw before. That was just an open source model that I got again, online somewhere, um, and I drop that into the center of the scene, actually, for this one. So we've got this kind of snow dome with this photorealistic background, and I've dropped the drone in there. And now I'm pointing the camera at it, and I'm randomizing the orientation of the camera. So the camera is the, the distance to the, to the target, but also the, you know, all the different um, parameters that you can play with for the, the variation of the camera. And then I also played around with the light conditions slightly. So those HDRI um, backgrounds, they actually encapsulate um, lighting conditions in them. So you actually do get that for free when you bring in different backgrounds. Um, but I also did some sort of manual playing around with that. And then I generated the data. So there's a plugin for Blender called Blender Proc. And this is, um, this is open source. Uh, I've got some links at the end, which you can, if you're, if you're interested in finding it, but Blender Proc is exactly for this use case. It's been developed by I think from a university somewhere who have just realized that you can, that there's a use case for this kind of stuff. So you can see what I've got from this, right, is I've got these bounding boxes. So this is as if the humans done the labeling for me. And this took sort of, I think I generated about 5,000, 10,000 of these. Um, it, it took a few hours on, on my like desktop machine at home. So it's not mega amounts of time. And you can scale that as well if you're trying to produce lots of them. So this is a Python SDK that you can use for Blender Proc, and it's really well done. Um, it's, it's not huge amounts of code at all, and it actually pulls Blender down for you, so you haven't got to do any kind of configuration stuff. It, it, it does actually kind of work pretty, pretty quickly. And then I did some evaluation. Um, this, is a first, this was the first pass, and it, and it does pretty well, right? So there's, um, this isn't synthetic now, this is real. And there's some false positives in the background. And I'll be honest with you, I, haven't, I didn't try and optimize this at all. I, I was doing this just to try and demonstrate to some uh, to some stakeholders that this this concept kind of works in general. If I was being critical of what I've done here, I would probably get some other things flying through the scene and seeing what false positives I get, right? So if I had a bird fly past or something, I, I reckon we'd probably get some false positives. And at that point, what I'd do is I'd go back and I'd update the data. I'd say, okay, well, let's add some um, add some birds to the set. Let's go and take some pictures. And they wouldn't necessarily have to be synthetic. You know, we could just, we could just add lots of different pictures uh, into that mix. But that idea of updating your training data to see better results on your validation set is actually the power of, uh, of using this sort of synthetic approach. So this is just a quick video I thought I'd include. This is on the Blender Proc thing, so you can just get a feel for what they, what they offer. So again, you need somebody who understands how to like create 3D assets and things, but you can see the types of um, the power of what you get from this, where you can actually start to create scenes where you know you would never be getting a human labeler to sort of um, to do stuff to that, at that level of of complexity. Pausing there, then that's the kind of the concept and and the sort of simple sort of hello world kind of this is how you might get started with it. And then I want to talk a little bit more now about actually using more sophisticated simulators that are a bit more um, purpose driven for this type of work. So this is Nvidia's Isaac Sim, and Isaac Sim is 
a robotic simulator that's designed for being able to um, simulate very realistic environments for robots to operate in. It's used for all sorts of different use cases and it allows you to very easily import real components, real manipulators, real um, you know, robots that you might be using into highly realistic um, scenarios and have them, you, know, you can test them, evaluate them, you can do reinforcement learning, all that kind of stuff. So it's a really big, big, you know, serious thing. And it's designed to scale to very vast, vast scale. Everything NVIDIA does is designed to scale. And this is, there's a barrier to entry here, of course, right, to learning this. It's not just going to be a few lines of Python code. You really have to get stuck in, but they are um, making that easier and easier with sort of tutorials and things. But there's an extension, as they call it, to Isaac Sim, which is called Replicator. And Replicator is doing exactly what Blender Proc is just doing before. So it's, it's allowing you to use all the power of this rendering engine to, um, to still take all these different kind of shots. And, and you can see when it comes up all the you know, very sophisticated different types of, um, of labeling that you might need. So Isaac Sim is um, very powerful. And it's something that I'm sort of, in, when I'm getting time, I'm trying to sort of get up to speed as to sort of what it would offer you. But I think the main thing is, is if you're working in this space, that's in all likelihood you're going to want to move beyond just labeling data at some point, and you're going to want to start testing and evaluating. So actually starting here is a really good place. This is also fully supported by NVIDIA, like aggressively supported by NVIDIA because they want you to buy it. And you know, Blender Proc is, from my understanding, is, is more a kind of academic tool that, that people have created. So yeah, I, I recommend checking out uh, Isaacson. I'll carry on and then we'll do like questions and discussions. I think it'd be good to sort of have a bit of a discussion, but I wanted to talk a little bit just about generative data. Okay, so this was another use case that I was playing around with just to give you a feel for it. So we have generative models now. I think everyone's familiar with this, right? We have DALI, we have stable diffusion, we have all of these things. So we can actually just through a text prompt, ask uh, an algorithm to produce us 100 pictures of a particular, you know, thing that we're interested in. So this was a use case that I was, I haven't written this up yet, but I wanted to sort of test this idea of being able to take the Kaggle um, data set of all the different breeds of dog. So I think it's like a 200 breeds of dog. And then I sort of systematically just went through stable diffusion and asked it to generate me 100, 100 images of each of those breeds. So I just had a prompt, which was like, generate me a picture of this, you know, insert species of dog here. And then I varied the location. I was like on the beach in the countryside from, you know, just all these different prompts I could vary and then ran it through stable diffusion and got the, got the images and actually quite a costly process in terms of compute, but you very quickly get yourself a data set. So this doesn't have bounding box annotations or anything. So this is just like a mosaic of the sort of different ones that I, <laughs> that I produced. But it was just an idea that you could then train on this data and then test it against the Kaggle data set and see what kind of results that you, that you might get. Video language models are this, this thing that we're going to see more and more. Well, they're going to just dominate everything, I think, at some point. So this is this is going from text to video. So this is what Sora is, which is what Facebook are doing now. And not Facebook, sorry. This is what um, Meta, sorry, OpenAI are doing. Um, and, and we're going to see just more and more of this being able to generate stuff very, very quickly. And I think there's probably going to be a use case where you can take the stuff that's being produced by those ML algorithms and then actually use another algorithm to create your bounding boxes and then use that to train your smaller model, if that makes sense. So there's lots of ways you can kind of plug these things together to, um, to avoid having to collect and label data yourself. You need to be really, really mindful of data contamination when you're doing this. So with this example here, right, the, the stable diffusion in all likelihood has seen the evaluation set that I was about to test it on. It's going to have seen the Kaggle dogs thing. So these images are going to be inspired in inverted commas by the, um, the Kaggle data. Some of them could be near uh, near duplicates. So when you're benchmarking, it's a bit sort of like, well, you know, I'm not sure how, how valid that benchmark might be. But if you're looking just to get good results in, in reality, like in production, then, you know, just, just use what you can. It would be my, my, uh, my approach there. Cool. I've listed a few, uh, just a couple of the resources. I sort of ran out of time, as you can probably tell with the slides here. Um, but yeah, do we have any questions or any observations? Like, go for it. Like, feel free. Yeah. Gordon, um, it's just having generation of data as each coder. And I remember, I remember reading a paper about how his models are started to like homogenize or basically over fit. Because it if you generate their data, that's just so much range and create compared to real life. I do found this and it's an experience. So I wouldn't say I've gone into all seriousness of like deploying into into production, but but yeah, you, th this is exactly the the risks that that you you would face of any of these tasks is like overfitting or um, so the video language models that we're seeing that the, these so-called foundation models are going to have seen pretty much all the content that's on the internet, right? So they're going to have seen 
everything, which is arguably the most diverse sort of set of data that you that you can see. Um, but it's also going to mean, I don't know if I'm sorry if I'm not answering your question, but it's also going to mean you're going to see lots of models that are essentially the same model because they're going to have been trained on the same thing. So if you look at some of the large language models with like the 7 billion parameter ones, they've all kind of got the same data set in a lot of ways. So they're actually not really that dissimilar to each other. So really shaping and refining your data set is actually going to be really critical. And this is the challenge, right? You know, I've made it sound very sort of simple. Are we just going to generate some images and things? But actually tracking the results and, you know, you improve in one area, it doesn't get, it goes worse in another area or, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a hard problem. In the drone detection uh, demo that you showed, what part of the training data was actually synthetic? Was it the drone that was synthetic? Was it the scene that was synthetic? Or was it the variation in lighting and the location? So all the, the, all the training data that I produced would be classed as synthetic. So that the drone itself was a rendered, you know, like a polygon model that was being rendered through ray tracing. The background was a, was a photograph which I guess you could say it's synthetic in the sense that it wasn't being directly captured by a camera. Um, but the lighting and everything else, so all of those pictures came out of Blender, if you see what I mean. But I fine-tuned the model from um, a model that had been trained on a, you know, it was, I, I didn't train from scratch, if that makes sense. It it it'd probably been trained against Coco or something like, um, ImageNet or something like. It would have seen some real data in the sense that it had learned probably like all the ImageNet classes I don't know if that covers drones or not, but it would have, it probably would have, it would understand things that exist in the sky, for example. It's probably learned to distinguish that and then I'm fine tuning. The drone in that video isn't the drone, isn't, it, you know, it's not similar to the drone. I didn't attempt to model the 3D drone, if that makes sense. So, and I, I, I like I said, I should probably make that more of a rigorous kind of um, study, but it was just really a proof of concept of how to get that end to end pipeline working. Um, how have you played around with the other and scored these more to know models to? actually requested to give you a bounding box and uh, the label data back out there. So, no, I, this is something that I want to no, I haven't actually asked for, for labels from a large language model. I've used some uh, language video models, which, which again, I need to go into the, the absolute details of it. So there's a model called, I think it's called OWL, where you can essentially, um, I have a, a live video feed and you can just dynamically say what you want the bounding boxes to be. So I can say, put a bounding box around all the people and it suddenly it's all the people and now it's like put a bounding box around all the you know whatever the flower pots or something so you've kind of so I think that's why when I started putting this together I was thinking oh, I need to refresh this a little bit because there's so much new stuff that I could be looking at but I do think that's probably going to be the future is being able to generate images depending on your use case if you've got a really niche thing that some startups doing then probably you're not going to be able to just use it but if you've got like you know just this neat little thing you want sorted I, I do think you can you know, you can definitely harness the generative models for that. This might be more limited. The, I was just curious, what application do you based to the site? So the synthetic data stuff. So I, I was lucky enough to see some stuff at NVIDIA recently, and they were talking about digital twins, which I actually missed out here. So digital twins is this idea where you have a near perfect simulation of the thing that you're, um, that you're building. So if you're building a factory, you first build a perfect simulation of that factory. And what we mean by that was not just sort of like a 3D rendering of that factory, but you're actually modeling every single component in that factory. And the idea there is, is that you can, like, you can optimize the running of that factory before you even start to begin to build it. That's one of the main use cases. You can also experience that factory through virtual reality. So you can walk around your digital twin before you even start building it. But the robots and all the automated stuff that's going on, all the sensors and everything, can all be experiencing th thousands of years of experience of, of existing in that factory before the factory is even built. So the idea would be that when you go and build it, you build it much quicker because you have all this technology and all this, this reference point, which is the digital twin. But when you drop your robots into that space, they've already, to them, it's almost like they haven't, nothing's changed, right? There's, if your digital twin is good enough, and to them, they're just in this, it's like the opposite of the matrix, right? They've gone from the simulation into reality um, and, and suddenly they're working really, really well. Um, or they can use the digital twin for planning, right? They could use it for, you know, a box has just suddenly got in my way. I'll just go and experience what, how to get around that in the digital twin for a thousand years or something. You know what I mean? They can actually use that and then go, okay, I'm gonna go and do this once they've worked out. So I think that stuff's really cool. Um, they're using it for like warehouses and very controlled environments at the moment, environments where they can control everything, the light levels, and it's a big market as well, I think. Taking that out into reality is, you know, that's, that's going to be hard because reality is much more complicated, like true outdoors, you know, all sorts of stuff goes wrong. But in a controlled environment like a warehouse, I think that's, um, 
Well, we are we are seeing that already. So the, this is I think this is a really great tool. We've, we've been doing something similar actually you know, with the text. So using like a fake language model to create label text data, and you use an some and create data. Yeah. So what's happening with the, the cost of big models is coming like down down so fast. It's actually you may as well just use the big model like rather than drain us all. Yeah. One of the issues with, with those big models, we do a lot of stuff about edge-based deployment, so we can't rely on, a, on a, an internet connection. So we're looking at deploying, say, on a drone or on a robot or something, so we can't actually call back to those models. And we're also looking at very low latency, like real-time low latency, where we can't have any lag in terms of like referencing it. And even if we had direct connections to one of those large language models, I think the inference time would probably be too long. So I think we always want to like be thinking about, I think smaller models will always have their place. Um, and and what you've described there is absolutely the right approach, I would say, is to harness the amount of training that's gone into those large foundation models and then you know put that into your smaller models, without a doubt. Um, and yeah, I, I do understand that the cost has gone down, but the, the speed is, is something else as well. You know, so I've heard of people like get, creating a data set from, from ChatGPT4 and then training a smaller model on that in order to sort of do what ChatGPT4 would do for them. So they could be using it, but it's just too slow and a bit too costly. Um, but yeah, there is a trade-off, definitely. <laughs> I don't know. I'm incredibly jet lagged right now. So this is for all I know. This could be a dream for all I know. But um, yeah, I hope it's not a simulation. It feels quite real. Yes, that's true. Yeah, that's true. Cool. Awesome.